Yeah. Okay. So went through your vision and mission statements, which are you know, on, on the whole very good. Um, you know, some of you still, it still needs to be shaped, and you realize, I think we talked about this last week, it, it's hard. It's hard to get the words right, and um, I just made some notes generally. Uh, um, you know, some of you would have very abstract things like, and, and again, all very well-meaning, but I want to make a positive change in the world, or I want to um, make a positive change in people's lives, which, which again, is a really is good on a broad level, but we need to start thinking if we if we really want to do that, how will we know we did that, or how will we know um, that you've done that, or what is a positive change in someone's life? So again, the more definition, because it feels good to say that, but if you really if it's just this abstract thing, or I want to make a positive change in the world, um, what is change? You know, and does the world even need change? And what is a positive change? And again, so the more you can start to define these things the easier it is to start executing against it. Because if it's abstract as a goal, how you get there will be even more abstract. And whether you actually achieve it will be abstract. And what happens then is you kind of have this sort of delusional sense that you're doing something good. But if you sort of drill it down and you make actionable steps against it, it makes it easier. Um, um, one, you know, one of some, some people said, I want to live comfortably. Well, again, what does that mean? Because, you know, compared to probably 95% of the world, you all live extremely comfortably. So, you know, again, I think if you have a bed, I think you're already in the top like 60% of the world. So you're doing okay. So again, define these things for yourself. Again, doesn't, it's not for me, it's for you. So again, if it's actionable. Um, um, you know, and some of you said, I want to have strong negotiation skills, or I want to have certain, I want to be good at this. But what is strong, how do you manifest strong negotiation skills? Or how do you actually achieve it? How do you know you've arrived there, right? So again, good as a goal, but start to think about it, and then underpinning that with things that you're going to do to, um, uh, some of you gave the tools you'd use, like I'll use this to measure my success. All right, great. What outcomes from those tools are you going to use? Um, um, <laughs> a couple of you are like, I am going to leave my job now. And <laughs> Again, <laughs> sometimes that's totally good, but that isn't, a, that isn't really, um, that's, I'd like, if you're going to leave your job, I'd like to know to do what? Because sometimes, and this is the thing I want you to maybe take away from this is, and that's the idea of this aspirational revenue, rev, resume was, is you might actually be to, to, to achieve your goal where you are right now. It's just looking at it differently because sometimes you're like, I just got to get out of here. But if you actually sit back and say, well, this is what I want to achieve, and they already know me here, and I, if I just went to my boss and said, you know, could I start doing more of this or that? Then you're making steps, and it's so much easier than saying, you know, I want to get into social media. Well, you could probably do it where you work now versus saying, I'm going to leave and go work at Facebook, you know, because it's so much easier to do it where you are. So you can start taking steps today where you are, or you may re-look re at where you are today, and you might actually be doing what, exactly what you, do, you want to be doing. Um, uh, just so the, oh, and one other thing. Sometimes, some of you said your metrics were like, get a movie into Sundance, win an Oscar, um, which are, are, again, are great goals, but what may be wrong with those goals? Right, and what else is maybe a challenge with that goal, those goals? Well, they're difficult, but you have nothing to do with it. You can't, you can't control, so I would rather you say, I want to make a great film. I want to make an important film. And then in theory, you know, an Oscar, getting into Sundance, that's out of your control. So stick with the things you can control. You can make a great film. You can make a thought-provoking film. You can't get an Oscar. Now, once you are in that discussion, you can do everything you can to maybe improve your chances, but you know, a, a, you don't cede control of your success to somebody else. And that is succeeding it to the Academy or to you know, the acquisitions people at Sundance. All right? So control what you can control because um, there are a lot of people that you know, have never won an Oscar who made a great film and they achieved what they wanted to achieve. Um, or a lot of people that, that didn't get a movie into Sundance, and that movie was still a great movie and went on to success in other places. Um, so again, that should be, think of the things that you can control or you can affect, because otherwise you're, you're ceding you know, your own control, and you don't want to do that either. Um, 
And those are kind of the main ones, right? So can, but a good start, and again, what I would just ideally over time, you know, whether it's this or some other version of this, you use it and you refine it and you shape it and it starts to sort of lead you where you want to go. And, and this was really just an exercise because you are in control of you and eventually maybe you'll be in charge of an organization you're running. Uh, and that, that organization, you'll start to say, well, what's our strategy? What's our vision? Where are we trying to get to? How are we going to do that? How are we going to measure our success? And again, that's ultimately what all organizations are doing. Is they're laying out a, a goal, then they lay out a plan how to get there, and then they measure how they're doing against that plan, and then they refine it, and they do it again, and they keep shaping it. And we talked last week, again, who knows exactly what drove it, but the New York City Opera, you know, it's been around for 70 years, and maybe it was other factors, or maybe it was their strategic plan, or maybe it was their vision and their mission, but, you know, it, it, it's gone. It's gone because it didn't have a good plan, or it didn't have a good execution of, of maybe a good plan. I, you know, I'm not too sure. Uh, and you can say, oh, it was around for 70 years, so we can say, oh, the, you know, it's the city doesn't want, you know, the, the desire for art or opera is gone. Or you can say, how are we going to work around that? And, and again, we'll never really know because there's all sorts of contributing factors to these things. Um, okay, so anything, just we'll touch on the news real quick. Anything happening in the news related to media? Right over there. Good. So tell me, tell me what that. Tell me, tell me more about that. Well, um, film district is going to merge it, focus features, mm -hmm. and um, they were questioning um, what's going to happen to um, focus features' mission of bringing in more like prestige type films, uh, because film district is known for bringing more genre type films. Right. So that's a question that they're right now wondering what's going to happen to that. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen? The, um, but remember, we talked last week, we gave the example of, we were talking about organizational structures, right? And we gave the example of Warner Brothers, and we sort of picked who's going to be the head of Warner Brothers. going to be the film guy, the, the digital guy. Uh, so James Seamus has a great reputation as being maybe sort of more on the indie, sort of the def sort of defender of the independent film sensibility. Uh, he's a screenwriter, he's a professor at Columbia, uh, clearly an intellectual. And Peter Schlesel, his background is, he came from Sony, more on the genre basis, Insidious 2, White House Down. So again, if you start to think, again, you can sometimes glean by who they're putting in these positions. So they're removing James Seamus and they're putting Peter Schlesel in. And again, it may be Peter Schlesel's all the sort of going to manifest himself as a defender of art house films, but more likely, more likely it's a way of saying Universal, Comcast is saying, Thank you for this, but we want to focus on genre money-making films. There's a world for art, but that's not the that's not that's not where we want to put our focus. So, um, so again, the organizational structure is changing to fit a different strategy. Um, the, so there's a new head at Universal. Well, there's Comcast bought Universal, um, and then they just fired the chairman of Universal Pictures just a month ago. We talked about this. Um, and now they put a new guy in there who came from Comcast, and now he's putting his mark on the studio and saying we're going to focus more on probably genre movies. And when you do these sort of reorganizations, Focus has an office here in New York and an office in LA. They're closing the office here in New York again. So the not only is the they're changing the people, but they're changing the geographic location. They're moving all that out to Los Angeles. And this is a reflection of other things that have happened in the independent film world over the last, say, five years. Disney had Miramax, sold it. Uh, Warner Brothers had Warner Independent, closed it. Um, who else do we have there? United Artists, which is part of MGM, which is sort of a much more complicated story, doesn't exist anymore either. It may come back around. Uh, Tom Cruise briefly ran it. Um, and. Uh, so you can see there's sort of this consolidation and 
organizational changes because most of the studios are no longer focusing on these art house films. They're focusing on the giant, big budget films, and they're making fewer films. Larger films that are targeted to a broader international audience with, based on comic books, you know, brands, et cetera. So, so that, that change, that change in strategy is manifesting itself in the structure, both from a human resources standpoint, people, and also from a bricks and mortar of where are the people actually located. And they're not going to be in New York, which New York has for a long time been associated with the independent film world. The offices are closing was October films, which became focus features, and now they're, they're gone. So. Um, Why, why do you think? This portfolio is much worse, right? You get this gigantic junk car, got the capitals to buy mm -hmm. after. Right. I see the distribution angle. You know, you can put it as 3D, parking will reduce, so on and so forth. Right. But is that really worth the overall risk? I mean, you're putting all your eggs in one basket, essentially. Well, you're putting your, but you know, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. You're, but you are putting them in two larger baskets. You're not putting them in a very small basket that even on a good day, isn't generating a whole lot of revenue. So I think they're saying we have this large in distribution infrastructure, um, and even if we get a, you know, one of those films that really works for the most part, and Focus, you know, like Focus did Hyde Park on the Hudson, which really didn't work. So why are we, and, and the other thing you realize, again, from a structural standpoint, not to go too off on this, but the independent film business used to be a totally separate, different kind of business. It was different theaters, it was publicity driven, um, so it was almost like a different, there were different people you'd talk to. So if you want to book an independent theater, you'd call the Angelica, you'd call the Sunshine, and there was similar, but increasingly, the movies in the Angelica are also playing at the 14th Street, you know, multiplex. And so it's not different people. And therefore, like, you almost have, again, if you're just looking at it from a business standpoint, you have people doing the same thing in the same organization, and this person's generating a lot more revenue than this person, so why do we have two of them? Let's just have one, and we'll streamline everything. It's kind of the thought. And so the Peter Schlesel side is, let's focus on these genre movies, Insidious, White House Down, et cetera, and let's get away from the contemplative Czech, you know, uh, musings that, you know, whatever, <laughs> black and white Czech movie that, you know, uh, very few people will see because increasingly, again, it, most of it reflects your behavior. Most people don't go to the art house theater anymore. They'll say, I'll wait for it, I'll watch it at home. And again, if you ask someone, they say, I love independent movies, then you ask them, what did they see in the theater last? And invariably, it'll be something like Slumdog Millionaire or it'll be like one of the five that actually crossed over. But for the most part, it is not the little films. And so box office on a art house film today is in the hundreds of thousands, and you know, not that long ago, it was in the millions. So two or three million dollars you could do. Now it's 50,000, 100,000, 300,000. I mean, you can look at some of these films that are, exactly, again, it was a bad movie, but I, it was, was it last year or two years ago? Um, it was the Madonna movie, W.E., which is based on the um, um, uh, Mrs. Simpson. Uh, I mean, it did something like $300,000, you know, it was like, and now it's, you know, you'd think they could have muscled that to a couple million, but it's, you know, again, it was not a very good movie, but people don't really go, and it costs, it costs the same, and when there isn't the ancillary market supporting it, it becomes an obvious decision, and then you look at all your competitors, and you start saying, you know, Disney's not stupid, and Disney had Miramax, you know, so Disney was like, we're not in, we don't want to be in this business. I, I gave this in the, in the other class. You know, I had a friend at Disney doing home entertainment, and she was like, you know, even a successful, you know, art house film may do 300,000, 400,000 units in, uh, you know, DVD, uh, but Finding Nemo does six million. So why, and that's like, that's in a good day, you've got like some movie that's really doing well. Like, uh, the King's Speech did not really do that well in terms of uh, answering markets, which is surprising. You know, it won the Oscar. Um, but, and you start thinking about behavior. Yes? Well, I just, it, it got a little more interesting this weekend with Gravity. Right. Well. Yep. And it was such a smashing thing. Everybody, crazy critics, and everybody was like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. I mean, Gravity 
Potentially, yeah. Right. And lost a lot of money. And I'm sure on paper that looked like something that would reach wide audiences and really bring a lot of revenue. But since they put so much into it, it was like a huge disappointment hit for the company. But movies like The Purge and Insidious 2 and movies that don't cost a lot and aren't good, people still see them. Right. Like Sharknado was like all anybody could talk about for like two weeks. And that was like widely thought to be a horrible movie. But I feel like. Just looking from like a financial standpoint, I, I, it's disappointing to say that, but that seems to be the area where Sharknado is the future. <laughs> right, but but you what you're discussing, you're talking about Sharknado, Purge, Insidious Two. You're talking genre movies. That is what Peter Schlesel does. So that. And so, I'm, I'm sticking because those are the ones that pop out of my head. Right. I just mean like bad. <laughs> bad, good movies. I, I saw the Purge. Right. Like, Right, and and like we talked about this, um, someone you went and saw Purge too, right? Uh, Insidious too, um, and you didn't care that it cost five million or eight million. You you want you paid thirteen dollars. You didn't care, whereas you didn't go see Lone Ranger, which cost three hundred million. So the price doesn't have anything to do with it, really. If if it's something you're compelling, and that's so. But your point is right on. And that's what I think Universal, someone at Universal, again, they have all this data. They have more data than you and I have. And they're like, huh, these are working. Insidious 2, um, Hyde Park on Hudson, not so much. And you know, so younger demographic, Hyde Park on Hudson's older demographic, probably going to stream it, going to you know, maybe watch it with his friends repeatedly. We can make sequels. Who wants to see the sequel to Hyde Park on the Hudson? You know? <laughs> It's, it's then they drove home. The, <laughs> so again, you start thinking about it from a business standpoint, that's what they're doing. It's exactly, you, you're, you're, you're totally right. That's what they're doing. They're, they are saying, let's go in the direction of Insidious 2 and these kind of genre movies that can actually take off. And, and Peter Schlesel had been at Screen Gems, which had had success finding these movies that could really cross over and do well. Whereas I think their feeling is this art house world won't cross over. And ultimately, you know, all these, organ all these sort of distrib distribution arms of a studio, they're looking for movies that they think they can do well. Sometimes they may say, oh, this is important, we'll do this. But increasingly, they're looking for the movies that they think can do well. And Gravity is a good example, but Gravity wasn't that expensive, really, you know, relatively speaking. And what happens, uh, people do try to extrapolate from some movie doing well. So the Lone Ranger tanks. You know, and having to write off $190 million, you can pretty make a pretty good case. Like, I don't want to do that. That's a, I don't like that feeling. I don't want to do that again. Insidious 2 did well. Let's do more of that. This did, I don't know, what it, I forget what the cost. It was probably like $60 million. It wasn't that. And it had movie stars in it. And a lot of people are saying, you know, movie stars no longer matter. Now with this, they may say, well, maybe they do matter. So it's, you know, you kind of just use whatever most recent piece of data you have to try to make a decision. And it'll talk, that'll sort of stream into a little what we're talking about today because people have tried to do the Moneyball version of film because there's a lot, a lot of data. And you can say, like, all right, well, how can we sort of predict? But the problem is with film is it's subjective, you know? So it's like why, why gravity worked could be just the alchemy of Sandra Bullock, you know, Alfonso Cuaron, um, George Clooney, who knows? Or, the right date or all those things. You know, the data gets a little hard because you're not comparing likes. It can be at different things at different times. Um, but the point, of, but the, the point about focus is it sort of echoes what we talked about last week. Is is oftentimes you know you have a strategy and then your organization structure has to reflect that strategy. And as what we're seeing happening is a change in that in that strategy. And by the way, it may change again back to art house films. So, you know, Miramax was the first studio to go into, I mean, Disney was the first studio to go into the art house world with Miramax after, um, I guess it was the Brothers McMullen, I think. Um, they started to say, like, we can start doing this. And then every, every other studio follows, saying, let's start our own art division. And then pretty quickly, I think they started saying, like, and again, I'm sure most of it was economics, like, mm, this isn't, we got a lot of overhead. And we're not making a lot of money. Let's stop doing this. 
The other thing that has happened, again, I experienced this a little bit myself, is um, there becomes a, um, a diffusing of executive focus because if you have, like, I was at Universal and they had October films, and October films, then all of a sudden the president of, of Universal is spending an awful lot of time, you know, with how October films is doing. And October films are generating maybe two or three million dollars in box office, yet their senior executives, who are probably being paid two or three million dollars, <laughs> are like spending 50% of their time on these, you know, because they like it or it's interesting. So that's another structural thing. Again, just human nature can lead into it. Right. Et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, so that's another way of investing in sort of that type of film. Right. That more and that's just, and, and, and it's, you're totally right. And, and I think the studios have said, go do that. That's not our business. Our business is a global, we have a global distribution infrastructure that we want to leverage. And so, you know, what will happen, just like publishing companies, when one of those movies that is made in collaboration with a robot, which I'm not entirely sure I even know what that means, then, then that person, the producer, the director, may eventually say, wow, we kind of caught lightning in a bottle with our robot made movie, and we want to get a broader, broader audience. So what are we going to do? We're going to fly to Los Angeles, and we're going to have meetings at all the studios, and we'll say, hey, can you take our robot movie to the rest of the world? because we're not really equipped to do that. It's the same thing in the publishing world. That's, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey or even Harry Potter. They were done on very independent, or I think Fifty Shades of Grey was self-published. And then eventually the woman was like, you know, publishers saw that she was getting traction and they said, hey, we can bring this a lot broader than you'll ever do it on your own. And so let us take over for you. And so that's, what the, that's where the studio, same thing in the record business. So at some point, they have the power, the relationships to get it out there. But the robot people, for lack of a better word, are not going to be able to go book it in 2,000 screens across the country unless they have a whole lot of money and a whole lot of leverage. Why? Because the theater owners are going to say, OK, look, I like your weird little robot movie, but, but why would I, you know, I may take this one, but then what about the next one and the next one, all right? So why don't you take it to Sony? We, have a, we talk to them all the time. We talk to them once a week versus getting your, you know, sort of unsolicited, and that's where, the, that's where their leverage can start to be. So I think their theory is, we'll get that gem. That gem will eventually come to us anyway. So we don't need to have a division devoted to finding them, because if it's really good, we'll, we'll get it. Um, and, we, and no one else can compete with us, because no one's willing to spend that kind of money. Um, anything else? Yeah, no, it, that was fascinating. I mean, and and darkly brilliant. I mean, it was a totally anonymous exchange with a currency not regulated by any government. And so, you know, and and I think the only, I think the only, it took him a long time. The only, the only way he was undone is it, you know, human error. He stupidly used his own address at one point. I think for I forget for what purposes, but he typed in his own name. You know, so, um, but. It does show you, like, you know, you start getting into this world of currencies, these different currencies of ways, you know, again, it starts to make your mind spin about, like, well, that's totally wild, you know? And again, I mean, he seemed like a fairly clean-cut guy that was probably just using his brilliance in a weird way. I mean, he, it seems like he could have just made that in exchange for other stuff, you know, rather than, than something illegal. Um, and he may spend the rest of his life in prison, which is really a shame because he's clearly talented and bright. Um, but the Bitcoin thing is fascinating, I think. Um, Apparently there's a second Silk Road already online. It's a community as a whole, but we can't make it. Amazing. And, and the poor, I mean, the guy was in like the San Francisco Public Library. I mean, 
you'd think he would have been in like the, at least like the you know Mexico City Public Library. <laughs> this is a little safer. Um, Right. So yeah, basically they announced that Facebook uh, the shares went up. Yeah, Facebook is doing well because the reason they're doing well, we talk about we we've talked about this before, the story, and the story is they're starting to figure out how to monetize that you know that 1.2 billion users, and they're doing it mostly. And again, one of the concerns when Facebook went public was their mobile, you know, they were a little slow into mobile, and it seems like now because everyone sees that you know again if you think of a stock price being the reflection of the future, your, your future prospects, and mobile being what most people see the future being, and Facebook getting established with Instagram, which is a mobile platform, and selling ads on that, it's like, okay, I get that story. Like, mobile's gonna go way up, they're in the vanguard of selling ads on that, yeah, and they've got 1.2 billion, billion users, I, that's a pretty good story, right? That makes sense to me. So it's impressive. So Twitter was in the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. So I guess they're teaming up with Nielsen. Yep. And um, so there's two ratings now. One is a TV rating, um, and one is like a social media rating. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily correlate. Like the social media rating, Breaking Bad, was like the most viewed show. Right. No, and, and there's two sort of things to take about that. Again, we talk about sort of your own metrics, how you measure your success. And Nielsen is basically just a company that measures your success or the success of organizations. So you hire and, and so what Nielsen is doing is, again, so television is they're measuring success so they can take it to advertisers and say, this is how many people saw. Because your goal as an advertiser is to get the most people, the most targeted people to see your ad. So you want to know how you did. So there's your metric. How many people actually did or how many people in my target demographic actually saw it. So again, Nielsen is basically the purveyor of metrics. And what they're doing, again, sort of going to the readings is this adapt or die. They're not just saying, we're just going to keep doing our little, you know, uh, Nielsen family ratings. We're going to adapt. We're going to start coming up with new metrics that are relevant to the changing world around us. So we're going to come up with a metrics that's rel related to social media. I mean, Twitter. Um, you know, there's a class, Paul Lindstrom teaches a class, it's online. He's a senior executive at Nielsen. And again, sort of, he was telling me the other day that, you know, in the United States, um, there's, you know, you have to opt in to having your um, location followed, you know, you do on your phone. Not so in a lot of other countries. So he's like, in other countries, we know everything. You know, we know where you go, we know what you did, you know what, you know, we know that you go to McDonald's and then you tend to go to Target. I mean, so this information becomes very, very valuable because advertisers want to get to that. Yeah. You talk about how people have to opt in in order to be kind of like a leader, I guess. Uh -huh. No, they still do the diaries, but, it, but it's becoming less, you know, because for instance, on a lot of like things like, um, uh, like Apple TV, I mean, they know who you are. They know what you're watching, when you're watching, just like Netflix. Netflix knows your address. They have your credit card information. They probably know your age, your social security number. So, and they know exact, they, they don't have like a, like an algorithm predicting what you watch, they know what you watch. So it, that data will start to get more and more refined and shaped. And that's the thing about Facebook. Like Facebook, they know, you know, and you told them, you said, I, this is where I went to college, this is the kind of music I like, here's a picture of me with my friends. Like they know, this is what I look like. Like they know a lot about you. And with that knowledge, they can do a lot. Right, so that data becomes more and more valuable as as you. So that that will change slowly in time, but and Nielsen's changing with it. That's what I found fascinating about Nielsen. They're kind of like monopolizing, I guess you would say, because they have Nielsen, Nielsen Audio, which is formerly Arbitron. Yeah, they just bought Arbitron, right? So they just take over the whole thing. No, they're they're becoming, and again, they're trying to burnish their brand name as we are the definitive place when you want to go to get. Um, audience information, right? And there's not, you know, and they're on their own increasingly. And so they can start doing, you know, they can start doing it and that's why they're moving into Twitter and they'll, you know, 
and why not? You know, I mean, you could go start your own one, but what do they have? They have money and a, and a, and a brand name ahead of you. So, but other than that, they don't have too much. You know, they're just kind of coming up with a, an idea. Um, anything else? Yep. Um, so I found out the hard way that the Style Network was canceled. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so sad. Esquire took it over. Right. Um, and when I was doing some research, I found out that the head of NBC in the cable division, Bonnie Hammer, she said that um, she canceled it because it's like redundant television, which it is. Right. But I find that pretty interesting that like an actual woman in that position finds the need to like advertise more to the men. So I mean, that's pretty much what Esquire TV is. Right, and what two things with Esquire TV is one, they're taking the an analog brand like Esquire magazine. And again, you know, I mean, well, let's just say, do you know when I say Esquire, what are you talking about? You're talking about men's fashion, right? Kind of. I mean, that's what I think of. So I don't need anyone to explain to me what it is. Style Network, I'm not entirely sure what that is necessarily. Again, I'm a guy, so I might not know any. Yeah, Jersey Licious, right? <laughs> Saying them, I don't even know what that means either, thankfully. But um. But so you can see what they're doing, and they're starting to say, but, it, but it's smart because NBC wants to deliver to a broad range. And if she's saying one's redundant, they'll say, well, we are a little, you know, we need shoring up here. Just like Disney was a little shy on content for young men or boys. So what'd they do? Bought Marvel, and they bought Star Wars, Luke, George Lucas. All right? So all of a sudden, you know, they went from being the home of the princesses to, We've got stuff for boys because that's and that's the way you do it. You just you say where you know are we sh because what they an advertiser is going to come to them and say, I want to reach this demographic and they're like, well we can put you on the style network and they're like, well that's not we want to get guys and so maybe again I'm not sure their whole portfolio but that's the way they're going to try to reach them and it's a way to sort of have more for their salespeople to sell more sp slots or content. Yeah, Makes sense. Why do you think that might be? I feel like the, the men who watch, like some of the programming that I've seen, like on Esquire, is like knife fight or something in the kitchen, right. like men cooking, and then this like beer battle. Right. And then you have Sex in the City, so I feel like it doesn't really align with the brand of Esquire. Right. But why might that be? I guess for people who miss Style Network, like I do, and still watch Sex in the City. More, more likely, again, I don't know the right answer, um, is they. Hey, well, I work at Logo. So gay men. Or alternatively is they made a deal on Sex and the City so they already paid for the content and therefore they just gonna run out that license. So it's you know it's probably expensive content that they paid for. So why not keep it on? Like you said, it might be good for to attract to a gay or a gay audience too. So again, it'll be interesting it'll be interesting to see what they program before and after it because that's usually an indication that they're building an audience. Again, what you sort of the lead in, the lead out is sort of like you try to you sort of you take an audience, you kind of like, you know, it's like a party, you want to, or a restaurant, you know, where they slowly transition from like restaurant to club. And uh, so you want to make that kind of smooth transition. Like you don't go from the blue plate special to like club, right? You kind of make it smooth. Um, so again, I'm not, it'll be interesting. Take a look at what they're, I don't know, maybe come back and tell us next week what they have before and after it. I'm not too sure. Um, yeah, yeah. It's still actually a testing template when I look at NBC. So I don't know uh -huh. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, so the, again, that's the other way to do it, is it's a sort of experiment too. It's good. We got this kind of. We got it right from the uh, competition into the in-house. So how was it when they fired everyone else at the Style Network? Was that like a sad I don't know about that portion. I just know they transitioned from Style to Esquire. That's what they tried to incorporate into the material. Like, like, um, they basically catered to men and women, so they combined everything. So they're just kind of trialing things or trialing things for men and women. Good. Thanks, Tyler. Um, two other, in film, Blue Jasmine, the Woody Allen movie, they tried to take it to India, and India has rules about smoking. And there's two scenes of smoking in the movie. Um, so they, were, they had to put warnings on the movie, and Woody Allen said, no, thank you. So, um, you know, because it's, you know, it's his art form. And uh, so they will not run in India. Now, I'm sure there was a economic evaluation of that too and they're like you know it's not going to no one it's not going to be very big in india anyway so let's sort of fall on our creative swords and then we'll sort of do better maybe in the home entertainment market um but again this is where you start getting it's kind of interesting where you get the government involved you get commerce 
and then you have art, right? And so all those three are sort of colliding in that area as well. And then also lastly, the Oscar, the uh, foreign submissions for the Oscars, all the companies, so the countries for their foreign language Oscar, so the 76 countries that are submitting films, their best film for their country that will then get narrowed down to, I believe, you know, somewhere like five, four to five films to compete for that one Oscar. Um, we're going to do one kind of thing, which some of you may have seen before. Uh, let's see here. Let's go on in one second, I think. Okay, so you may have seen this before. If you do, just keep that to yourself. What your job is, there's going to be guys in black and guys in white, and you want to count the number of times that people in white pass the ball to each other, okay? How many passes does the team in white make? All right, go. Go! How many? 13, 11, 12. So I heard everything from 11 to 13. How many 13s? Good. How many 11s? 12s? Okay. Anything else? Nothing else? Nothing else to note? You've seen it before? Okay. There's nothing else noteworthy there. It's just, um, you didn't see like a gorilla or anything? <laughs> like a dancing gorilla? A bear? You saw a bear? I saw a unicorn, which is weird. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, now look at it again, all right? This is an awareness test. Now don't count this time, just look for the bear. How many passes does the team in white? Or gorilla, I guess it is. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> Okay, so why did you miss it? Why didn't you see the gorilla dancing, moonwalking? What's that? Well, Luis? I was saying we were so focused on the team in the morning. Right. We weren't paying attention to Right. Um, my sister showed, my sister's a doctor. She said this is a thing they commonly show in medical schools where it's, you know, so if you were go to a certain kind of doctor and they come in and they're geared towards whatever, you know the common cold, they may miss something that's much more serious because they're looking for something. You know, they're conditioned to look for something. So you were preconditioned to look at the white and therefore you missed something else that was really obvious in front of you. You know, it happens all the time because if we're sort of totally looking at something, either one, we may miss a serious problem or we may miss a large opportunity. And it's sometimes, you know, the example, what would be an example in the media business of someone that missed a large opportunity that was right in front of them? Newspapers. What was the opportunity they missed? Uh, to develop fairly digital platforms to avoid the mm -hmm. catastrophe. Right. And it goes back a little to what we talked about last time with, you know, the sort of the Boston matrix of the cash cow can sometimes sort of overtake. You're like, well, we just want to protect our core business. We don't want to do something that would change. <coughs> What's it? Yep. Blockbuster. Blockbuster. Exactly. So we could talk about Blockbuster. There's no reason Blockbuster shouldn't be Netflix, and Netflix is something we've never heard of. How about out something else? Like in our ratings with the Wang, um, we had like all those industrial computers and so now we're going to have our PCs and then 
Exactly. Wang owned that business. It was theirs, and they didn't think it would be, you know, a challenge. iTunes. I mean, there is no reason whatsoever Apple computers should have gotten into the music business and let, and let the music business allow that to happen. No, but, but it did, because they saw an opportunity that they were not seeing, you know? So they were holding on to that sort of same thing with Netflix, I mean, with uh, Blockbuster. They were holding on to a, an old paradigm, and it's sometimes hard to see the new paradigm that's right in front of you. And again, I think Steve Jobs is like, you know, I think he, he even articulated, he's like, I thought we'd missed it. Like, I thought we had missed the opportunity. And, um, and so the, and the iPhone, I mean, you know, that was BlackBerry's business. Um, uh, or it could have been AT&T's business. It could have been a lot of people's business, you know. Uh, and again, I think Steve Ballmer came out and said, no way will anyone buy the iPhone. No way. You know? So again, Microsoft could have had that business. But sometimes you miss that thing that's right in front of you. And it can sometimes be perilous as well, whether it's you know, a disease or some big glaring problem that's in front of you. you know? or, or the other example we said is like, you know, Google tried to sell themselves to, to, to Microsoft for a million dollars. You know, they tried. They were declined. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of search. So something, again, so sometimes, and, and it goes into our readings a little bit. So in the readings, we talked to, you know, they explored the idea of instinct. What do we, when, when we say instinct, what's, you know, we, I gave the example of blank. Again, didn't make you read the whole book, I just gave you a review, which is an easier way if you want to read the book, you can. Um, so that's just the poor man's way of assigning the book without you having to read the whole book. But what was one of the sort of the stories that, even from that review, and they mentioned it in one of the articles too, from Blink. Everyone here read Blink? It's worth reading. It's, it's kind of fun. So g give me one of the, the sort of the main story they talk about with the... A guy who bought like a statue. Right. He had like, done a bunch of research about the four parts to like determine the legitimacy of it. And then an art critic who like was a Right. And they had all carbon dated and have all sorts of stuff that was sort of empirically implying that it was of the date that they were saying it was. And this guy, and again, there was a lot of data indicating that it was of this certain date. And he came in and saw him and he said he what he likes to do when he looks at anything is, is listen to what's the first word that pops in his head. It's kind of a fun thing to do for yourself, like whether it's a restaurant or whether it's a date or whether it's a... Uh, uh, a job interview is what's the first word that pops in your head when you walk in there? And it might be, you know, I like it here, I don't like it here, scary, you know, whatever. And his, the, the word that came to his mind was new. And he's like, what a weird word to pop in my head, new, you know, when I'm looking at a classic piece of art. And from that he gleaned, you know. So, you know, the hypothesis that, that Malcolm Gladwell is putting forth is that we have these machines, you know, our brains are these, you know, very, very, very sophisticated computers that thin slice, for lack of a better word, they take a small piece of data and we can extrapolate quite a bit from that. And we talked last time, remember we had the example of George Bush versus Al Gore. You know, George Bush was very instinct driven. These are my instincts are telling me this. And Al Gore was a little more, you know, drill down. My instincts would tell me I'll delegate and I'll delegate. And Al Gore was much more wonky, for lack of a better word, and sort of empirical. Um, what's another example? How many, how many people here have pretty good sense of their instincts? Good. Yeah. We should. I mean, you're, again, we, we are all animals, <laughs> and we all have instincts that, we're, you know, that are primordial, really. So uh, listening to your instincts is good. But what's another good thing to do? What's that? Being rational. Being rational. And backing it up a little bit, too. But the problem is sometimes you can let the rational eclipse the instinct, again, kind of there a little bit. We sort of like, we were missing something really right in front of us because we were so focused on counting. Um, and you can do the same thing. You can sort of so focus, but at the same time, you can get a little blinded by, you know, just listening to your instinct so much that you think, you know, God told you something to do or this is, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. I'm gonna just show you, um, this little video, if I can figure out how to do it on here, I think I can. Uh, let's see if this works. Anyone see the movie Moneyball? Yeah. You like it? Because it's got Brad Pitt. 
Um, so this is the guy, this is sort of, so the book is really good if you haven't read the book. The book's great actually, and it, it's not just from a baseball perspective. Um, but what, you know, what it is doing is disrupting the way, let me see. So this, this, is, the, it's ba this is the 60 minute story on the actual guy um, that it's based on. At last, the summer game is back. Hope once again rears its pretty head, and the sound of play ball is heard in the land. Baseball is a game like no other. Despite the obscene salaries and even more obscene steroid cheating scandals, it remains rich in tradition, a favorite of poets and dreamers, and most of all, of statistical wonks who believe that enlightenment lies in the correct reading of the numbers. Which brings us to Bill James, the wonk of wonkdom. James is the wizard hired by the Boston Red Sox five years ago, and since then the team that was a congenital loser for 86 years has won two World Series. James invented something called sabermetrics, loosely defined as the analysis of baseball through objective evidence. Whether it actually works or not is open to debate, but baseball, with its unshakable reliance on superstition, believes the Red Sox have found themselves one extremely lucky charm. We found him at spring training in Fort Myers, Florida, strolling through Red Sox Nation in the pungent air of beer and hot dogs and hero worship. A shambling giant who strolls unnoticed among the stars and the starstruck fans about as athletic as a night watchman in a pork and beans factory, which is exactly what he was. Did you try playing baseball? I did play baseball, but I have no athletic ability whatsoever. What position did you play? I played wherever anybody else wasn't playing. He still does. The Red Sox created a new position, senior advisor for baseball operations. An unlikely guru who for 30 years had been declaring that many of baseball's hallowed beliefs were ridiculous hokum. I remember by the time I was 14 or 15, I had begun to realize that a lot of baseball's traditional wisdom didn't actually make sense. When did you realize that uh, baseball was going to be your life? When I failed at everything else. <laughs> Growing up in Mayetta, Kansas, rooting for the old Kansas City A's, James, consumed by baseball, couldn't help but adapt college courses to his first love. I went to a state university in the Midwest and they tried to teach me economics and I took everything that they tried to teach me and applied it to baseball. He tried a variety of jobs, finally ending up as the night watchman at the Stokely Van Camp Pork and Beans plant in Lawrence, Kansas. To pass the time while watching the beans simmer, he brought his stack of box scores to work. Thus began the theory of sabermetrics. There were certain things that Major League Baseball traditionally believed that I argued were nonsense. One, that you could evaluate a pitcher by his one loss record. Two, serious disagreement on what drove an offense. Like batting averages, the oldest way to measure a hitter. James believed that players who got a lot of walks and wore down pitchers were overlooked. So he embraced a new statistic, on-base percentage, which has become part of baseball's Bible. As for pitching... You said that one-loss records do not tell you how good or how bad a pitcher is. Right. The most accurate things is to focus on the strikeouts, the walks, the home runs allowed, and evaluate the pitcher on that level. So James stresses another statistic, the strikeout-to-walk ratio. He says for decades, managers used outdated formulas or intuition in making decisions. So night after night, he crunched numbers until he came up with new statistics based on facts that would either support or debunk tradition. In 1977, the Night Watchman became so confident of his theories that he published them. The Bill James Baseball Abstract was born. It was 68 pages, mimeographed and stapled, and even a tiny ad in the sporting news. Did you have a hard time convincing people of what is the basic truth of baseball? I was a night watchman. <laughs> I was working in a factory in Kansas. I didn't have a prayer of convincing people who had been in baseball for 40 years that I understood something that they didn't, nor reasonably should I. I mean, the, uh, 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 it, it wouldn't have made sense for them to listen to me, and they didn't. 
But James did gain a small following that kept growing, and by 1982, a major publisher had signed him up. He's actually the pioneer of a whole school of thought. Bob Costas, the NBC commentator, is a true believer. It changed the way I looked at baseball. The idea that the most important hitting statistics are on base percentage and slugging percentage, it seems simple, but basic baseball statistics hadn't taken that into account. Costa says James debunked many of baseball's myths. The old belief that pitchers prevented stolen bases. James proved it was the catcher who made the difference. That kid is some catcher. Some other theories seem unsupportable, like James's dictum that there's no such thing as a clutch hitter or that batting order has no significance. But his numbers did show that the sacrifice bunt is rarely worth the out and that the use of the so-called closer is a wasted pitching resource. Why does your closer only have to pitch the ninth inning? Bill has said for a long time, why wouldn't you bring in your best reliever with the tying or go-ahead runs in scoring position and the best hitters for the other club coming up in the sixth inning or the seventh inning? Maybe the game turns right there. Costa says the key to Bill James' success is his simply expressed logic. Bill James is a very, very smart guy. Uh, who doesn't just understand information, but he's shown people a different way of interpreting that information. Though the abstracts became bestsellers and James became the voice of God to baseball geeks everywhere, Major League Baseball was slow to appreciate him. When James claimed that legendary manager Sparky Anderson was more lucky than talented, Sparky shot back that James was a fat little bearded man who knows nothing about nothing. That, maybe, bearded, yes, little, no way. His ideas were finally put into practice in 1997 when Billy Bean of the hapless Oakland A's used sabermetrics to fill his roster with young, underrated, cheaper players. It made the A's competitive. In 2002, the new management of the Boston Red Sox came calling on Bill James, ready to try anything to break the 86-year-old curse. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win it! Two of the partners, Tom Werner and Larry Lucchino, proclaimed James was part of a grand design. The team would not be your father's Red Sox. His reputation had preceded him, so we knew we were getting a, a, a guy with... Uh, it was unusual, and I, and I thought it was a giant step forward. The truth is, morally, this is a very sophisticated business these days, and it's very competitive. And I think when Larry and I first came into the business, the uh, general manager relied fairly much on gut instincts. And I think that what we've done is we've taken a much more systematic approach, which really comes from Bill. James sees his job as being the voice of cold reason based on hard evidence. Example. Fenway Park and its infamous left field wall, the Green Monster. Fenway was legendary as a right-handed hitter's park, but analysis showed it actually favored left-handed hitters. And the Sox lineup has been lefty heavy ever since. Looking up at the wall, goodbye. Red Sox general manager Theo Epstein says Bill James is the staff contrarian. I know with Bill that I'm always going to get um, a unique perspective, because I think he does see the game from a different vantage point than almost anyone else. His basic questions about the game have allowed us to think more critically about the best way to develop players. Even if he doesn't have the answers, he always has the questions. Makes you stop and think. Sure. About it. Neither the Red Sox nor James will reveal specific decisions based on James' input, but it's widely accepted that it was James who urged them to sign a jolly giant named David Ortiz. But James refuses to take full credit for Big Poppy. Everybody was in favor of signing David Ortiz. I liked him because of his numbers. The scouts liked him because of his swing. Some people liked him because they knew he was a positive guy in the clubhouse. Were there any people who said no? Yes, there was. There was a guy. Yeah. Is he still with the club? I think he is. <laughs> but I haven't seen him around the office lately. And what does the guru think about baseball generally? Best player of all, St. Louis Cardinals first baseman, Albert Pujols. Most underrated, Philadelphia Phillies second baseman, Chase Utley. And if he could have anyone on his team... David Wright. Of the Mets. Of the Mets. Why? 
because he does everything I like and he's very young. And age is just about the most important number of all to Bill James. Fair ball! Uh, players' best years are 25 to 29. That was true when I was a kid and is still true now. Many believe that Jamesian theory was behind the Red Sox decision to not re-sign hugely popular but aging stars Johnny Damon and Pedro Martinez, a decision that seems to have paid off for the Red Sox. But while Red Sox manager Terry Francona says James is an integral part of the Red Sox, you can't always play strictly by the numbers. This game's played by people. And, you know, I mean, certainly knowing the numbers, and I care about them, and it's important, but people play the game, and I never try to lose sight of that. Of course, on any given day, any professional baseball player can defy all the numbers in his yep. record. And the only reason they're ever going to be any good is if they believe in that. I would never want to say, hey, you're 0 for 20 against this guy, you can't play. We don't share that with the players a lot. We want them to feel indestructible. He's made some what sound like pretty dogmatic statements, like there's no such thing as a clutch hitter. I've, I've heard him say that, but then I would want him to be introduced to David Ortiz. <laughs> get my point. Uh, we feel pretty good when David Ortiz is hitting in the clutch. Swing and a fly ball to left field. Way back, way back. The Red Sox are going to the American League Championship Series on the back of David Ortiz. James is rethinking that one. But the players like Red Sox third baseman Mike Lowell say theories are for the front office, not the playing field. I don't think we come into spring training and say, man, hopefully we have a 960 fielding percentage. I don't think it gets that detail, but I think more teams are realizing that when you use these numbers, you're going to win more games. But in the final analysis, it's one guy with a piece of wood hitting a ball that's moving at 90 Absolutely. miles an hour. Absolutely, you can't put a number on that. <laughs> but one number, the number two, as in two World Series, still resonates. Boston Red Sox are world champions. Are you concerned that the evil empire, I think is otherwise known as the New York Yankees, are doing the same thing? Uh, yes, they are, but there are several teams in baseball that are doing it, but the Yankees always tend to spend a little more money at whatever it is they're doing. <laughs> James says he's always looking for new numbers to help the Red Sox, but even he admits the numbers will never say it all. There's something in baseball that you really can't quantify, right. and that is the mix of guys at a given moment there's some magic or whatever right. that goes on that all the Jamesian theory in the world will never find the answer to. It's mostly intangible. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't understand most of it. And I don't think that anybody in the Red Sox would tell you that we have that magic stuff figured out. But there are people here who understand that, that part of the equation a lot better than I do. Game over, series over, and the Red Sox... A couple of interesting things. First of all, um, Tom Werner, who owns the, uh, one of the principal owners there, he made his money uh, in television. Uh, Carsey Werner, so he's like, so the Cosby Show uh, came out of him. And then, um, if you actually watch the movie Moneyball, at the end of the movie, uh, Brad Pitt, Billy Bean, goes to see John Henry, who owns the Red Sox, and he says, you know, the first one through always gets kind of killed. So meaning like, if you are that first person who's looking at things differently, you usually get squashed. The benefit, John Henry says, of having money is you can hire someone like Bill James. And he says, you know, he's like, I'm amazed this guy wasn't hired a long time. I'm amazed he was available. You know, he was working in pork and beans, which has got to smell terrible. Um, so, and John Henry, going back to your point, uh, bought the Boston Globe. So, again, maybe he sees there being an opportunity like there is an opportunity here with baseball of looking at an old business in a new way or using new metrics or new ways of approaching it or analytics. And so in the readings too, they talked about ways of using these different analytics to explore even these digital businesses. And again, I don't know if you, any of you have any experience with Google Analytics, but the stuff that you as an individual can, let's say you have a Tumblr page or a blog, you can get the most sophisticated analytics of who's coming to your site, what platform, where, where the, what country they live in, what platform they use, what day they did, what do they do when they get there? Did they click through to other pages? I mean, the sophistication is unbelievable and it's free. It's available to anybody. Same thing with Google AdSense, where you can spend $10, $20, $100, you know, a million dollars on coming up with 
taglines and you can test them. Which ones are people, which ones are people using, which ones are they not using? And again, this kind of sophistication was not available, you know, it was really just available to sort of very high-end advertisers and now they, they become much more democratized and anybody can do it. So if you want to advertise, you know, a charity event or a party you're having on your rooftop, uh, you can use Google AdSense and, and it's amazing of the, the texture and sophistication of the data you can get. And, and so that's the whole concept behind the money ball of you is using statistics and, and, and measurements to evaluate something in a way other people can't. And so the distinction, this is the hard part, is there's the blink side. And so the blink side would be in baseball or any sport, so you could do it in talent, uh, in, in film too, of, of agents. Agents would go out and they'd watch players and they would make decisions based on their expertise that they've been doing this for a long time and they would, in the words of Malcolm Gladwell, thin slice. They'd say, the big guy is too slow, he'll never make it, you know? And they, if you see the movie, they talk about, you know, did you see his girlfriend? She's not attractive, he's got no self-esteem, you know, <laughs> using all these kind of weird things. Um, Whereas here they're saying, you know what, that guy may never hit, hit the ball, but he gets on base all the time because he gets walked all the time. And therefore there's a value to that. But that value was never measured before. So um, you can start to see, you know, the scout is a little more on the blink side using their expertise. Um, same thing with film acquisitions, you know, there are, we talked about focus, you know, all these studios will send their acquisitions people to the various, to Sundance, Toronto, Berlin, can to look at films, and they will make a distinction of, can we sell that movie? And they'll, you know, and they'll bring what they have. They'll bring their marketing people, and they'll say, I think that movie has potential, or I don't. And sometimes they're right. You know, sometimes there's a bidding war in some movie that, that no one goes to see, so they're wrong. And other times, you know, the example of Big Fat Creek Wedding, which you know, every studio, every single studio passed on that movie. No one wanted that movie. I actually talked to the producer of the movie. He was begging people to take it. He was like, just take it off my back. Like, it was a burden, a $250 million burden it turned out to be, you know? I mean, it was made for like $5 million, and then I think the US box office was $250 million on a movie that nobody wanted, nobody wanted. Um, Memento, uh, which launched Chris Nolan's career, nobody wanted. Nobody wanted that movie. Um, so again, it's, you start to say like you're, there's your instinct, but then the data bears out that there is a demand for these things. Just like you gave the example of the Lone Ranger, you do it by the numbers. Johnny Depp, you know, Jerry Bruckheimer, established you know, brand, even though from a long time ago, we we'll put those together, it's a formula, it can't lose. Well, it was a $190 million mistake. You know, it's a big mistake, and they did it by the numbers. So sometimes you can go on instinct, and this is your challenge to always sort of reconcile sort of data or measurements or empiricism with, you know, gut. And that's, that's a hard thing to do, but I think it's, it's good to sort of be aware that you may say, and I think the best thing you can do is to do the analysis and say, that's what the analysis says, but I still think we should do it for these reasons. I'm gonna override that analysis or, you know what, the analysis, my gut tells me we should do it, and the analysis says no, and I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna listen to the analysis. So you have to sort of use these tools, and, and again, you'll refine them as you get better at it. But I think just going all on your gut, that's like going to Vegas, and going just all on your instinct is also not the smartest way to approach it. Because again, we make mistakes. We, you know, I think you all would have said 13 was the number, there was nothing else. Definitively, you would have held that, right? But there's always things we don't see, and we're not looking for, there's little, um, to give the example in baseball, we could go out to a game for the next two weeks and we could watch the Yankees play. Um, and Derek Jeter is about a, I don't know, like I say, he's about a 300 hitter. And we would watch that game for two weeks and there would be another hitter who's like a 275. We would not be able to tell the difference. They would be in, you couldn't tell who was going to be a future Hall of Fame player and who's not because. 275 versus 300 is very subtle, and it's over a long period of time, and you might just be one more hit, so it's very subtle. Just like a successful company, it can be very subtle, or a successful actor or artist, it could be a very subtle distinction that, that separates them, but you would rely on your eyes, like, I think those two players are the same, or that guy got a bunch of hits, he must be better, and he may have just been on, a, on an odd streak, or it may have been an outlier, you know. Um, so, Couple ways to sort of measure things. Um, 
Okay, let's take a look here. Oh. What's probability? Anyone want to just give me a, anyone like to go to Vegas? Anyone doesn't want to admit they like to go to Vegas? Okay, what's probability? Quantified measure of uncertainty. What's that? Quantified measure of uncertainty. Right, that's a good way of putting it. Or, or what, is the, what is the chance of something happening or not happening, right? What is the chance? So how do we, so the chance of winning the lottery is very unlikely, right? But there's a chance, there is a chance. So it may be close to zero, but there's a chance. So something, something that's definitely not happening has a probability of zero, all right? It will never happen. And if it definitely will happen, the probability is one, 100%. It will definitely happen. All right, so we do probability on what is the likelihood of something happening. So if you're evaluating something, you, want to, you probably want to think, what's the chance of this actually happening? All right, so probability is a measure of how likely it is for an event to happen. We name it a probability with a number of zero to one. If an event is certain to happen, then it's probability of one. If an event is certain not to happen, then it's a zero. If it's uncertain whether or not the event will happen, then it's probability is some fraction between zero and one. All right, anyone ever see uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead? All right, so how does it start? Slipping a coin, right? And what happens with the coin? Oh, you never seen. Uh, that's the, <laughs> good. And now you get now you can't wait to see it because this is the whole play. <laughs> what happens? It no, it does not stand. Maybe it does. In the, maybe in the production you saw it stood up. But so what happens when you flip a coin? What's the chances of it being heads or tails? Fifty-fifty. And what happens in Rose and Clans of Gindlestern? Keeps coming up heads. Keeps coming up heads. Keeps coming up heads. And they start to freak out a little bit because they're like. What is going on with the world? Like it's keep, you know, I keep flipping it, it keeps being head, meaning that's weird, right? That's unusual that it keeps being heads. And you use, you know, we do that. We flip a coin because we think it's a 50 50 chance, right? So, chance is likely that it's something will happen. To state a chance, we use the percent again. So it's like zero, it's definitely not happening. 100% one, probability is half. So it's 50 50 on a coin. But now, if I flip a coin right now, I wish I had one with me, but I don't. 50-50 chance, all right? It comes up heads. What's the chance it's going to be heads the next time? Why? Every time it's 50-50. Every time it's 50 Why is that, Yang? Two outcomes. What's that? There's only two outcomes. So, so what just happened in the past has no bearing on it? It's going to be one third, right? It's going to, it's going to be one third? So it's going to be one third the chance. So it's more likely it's going to be tails the next time. Okay. How many think it's it's going to be 50-50? How many think it's going to be lower than that? Okay. Well, you're right actually. So it is. It's so again. It's an event. Each time I flip it is a new event. So therefore, it's a new chance again. But we do this. We sometimes think. You know, you go to Vegas, it's been red every time, it's got to come up black, right? <laughs> all right? Because that's what we tell ourselves. And then we get the free cocktail and they turn the lights out and all of a sudden we've got, you know, we're going home in like our foot with our, um, but it's a different event, all right? So each time it's a new event. Every time, so every time Reza Kenzo Gillen turns flip a coin, it's a new event. So it's 50-50 every time. But over, over time, this is the sort of, um, so, so first of all, just you assume that the coin is balanced, all right? Uh, the possible, what are the possible outcomes? Again, this is what you can want to sort of think about is anything you endeavor to do. What are the possible outcomes? So if we're going to invest in a movie, what are the possible outcomes? Well, the possible outcomes are it's going to be a massive success. The, ma the other outcome is no one goes. And then most likely somewhere in the middle. And then we'll try to get a little closer to that by, all right, what kind of movies have done like similar movies to this, how many people have gone? So now we start to drill down. This is what studios do. They start to drill. How about this director? How about this actor? All right? How have these films done in the past? Now we're starting to get like, we think it'll work somewhere in this realm. We might be wrong, and there's always going to be the film that sort of blows out. Um, so you draw a card, 52 card deck. What's the probability? You assume the cards are sufficiently randomized, right? You know, sometimes you're like, oh, you didn't shuffle the deck because everything's. Uh, what are the possible outcomes? What is the probability of spades? So you start saying, like, all right, how many cards are in there? What are the possible outcomes? Well, it could be one of 52 different cards, but then there's only four suits, all right? So it could, there's a 
25% chance it's going to be a spade, right? And then we start getting into these things. So you start defining what are the possible outcomes. And then you talk about frequency. So toss a coin, uh, it's impossible to predict the outcome because heads and tails in advance of 30. Toss a coin again and again, the proportions of heads and tails will tend to get to a fixed value. So we expect eventually, if we, so this is where we get the larger the number, the larger times we flip, it'll slowly, you'll have some sort of noise in those early thing, trials, but slowly you do enough, it'll get down to 50%. Um, so if it can be repeated indefinitely in the fixed conditions, of, you know, so you assume that the coin's balanced, the person flipping it's doing it in an orderly way, eventually it'll get down to what the relative frequency is and approach the fixed value, meaning that it'll get, eventually come down to that 50-50 chance, all right? So I, I think I can show you this graphically. Well, anyway, so, so number of tosses, number of heads is the F, and then the relative frequency. So the first time you, you do 10, you get eight heads, you're like, well, it must be an unbalanced coin. But then you do 100, getting down, and slowly, 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 we're getting down to 50. All right, and if we keep doing it, it'll eventually get right down to 50, because it's the more you do it. But you're going to have, you're going to have this, and this is what happens again in the film business is people say, I want to invest in a slate of films. That, you know, over 12 films, films tend to make money. So what happens? They invest in, and the first three films don't make money. And what happens? They're like, yeah, I don't like this. <laughs> this isn't fun. I don't like this business because you're betting that one of the 12 will justify all the other ones. But if the first nine or 10 don't work, same thing with the venture capital funds. I mean, I talked to someone the other day. They said, um, I forget what it was, but it was, you know, they invested in 50 companies, but one of those companies was um, Facebook. All the others tanked, but they still made money. So they were this close to being a total bust and said they were very successful. But, you know, it's hard for your investors that if Facebook was like the last investment, they're like, so you invested in 49 dogs and all of a sudden you're like, no, 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 but this is the one, you know? It's just like Vegas, you know? I think this is this, my ship's coming in on this one, you know, I'm gonna double down. You know how you make money in Vegas, by the way? You know your trick? If you have an endless amount, the thing is you need an endless amount of money. But if you want to double your money, you go to the roulette wheel, you bet on red or black, and then you just keep doubling down. And uh, so if you, let's say you want to make $100, you need an endless amount of money. And so you say $100. Because eventually, over time, it will get to black. So if you're betting on red, so you bet on black, so you bet $100 on black, comes up red. You double down $200 on black, comes up red. 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400. Eventually, when it hits black, you'll win that $100. You'll have doubled your money. But, but you might have to put an awful lot of money at risk. And if you don't have an endless amount of money, when you start getting to that 6,400, you're like, okay, you know what? I, I don't want to do this anymore. And that's when you pull out. But again, if you have an endless amount of money, that's how you double your money. And then the other thing you have to do is once you get that extra $100, you leave. Because <laughs> that's the other thing about Vegas is you're never really up until you've left because they're very good at making you think you want to stay. So going back to the, so the more repetitions, the better the approximation. So Sunday talks about the law of large numbers, which states that if an experiment is repeated a large number of times, the relative frequency of the outcome will tend to be close to the probability of the outcome. So again, this is the great thing about computers now is you can do these things, you can randomize these events, and you can sort of do, you know, rather than, than flipping a coin, you know, a thousand times, you can simulate that on a computer so you don't have to go through all those repetitions. And you can figure out, and again, in the film world, even in the tele television world, what they'll do is they do these Monte Carlo analyses, which they'll say, what are all the possible outcomes? Again, you want to define the possible outcomes, and then you go through all the possible scenarios, and then these Monte Carlo analyses is you have a computer go through all those repetitions of all those scenarios, and it'll give you the range of what your possible outcome is. So if you're going to invest in a slate of movies or a slate of things, it'll go through all the possible outcomes, combine them, give you every possible scenario, and say, this is about, you may, make, you may lose this much or you may make this much, but that's kind of probabilistically you'll be in that range. Okay, so here's graphically, again, so if you're flipping the coin, 
you're going to have a lot of noise and variance. But over time, the more times, the number of trials you take, slowly, 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 slowly. Again, it kind of makes sense, right? So we could flip a coin here, and it wouldn't. It pro most likely would not come up, you know, five tails, five heads. But if we kept doing it over time, you get to this. Does that kind of make sense? So it's just a repetition in the, in the, in the sort of the law of large numbers. Now, just to keep everything confusing, so I understand, I think it's back on the air, but let's make a deal is not a show you guys are familiar with, is it? No. Okay. All right. So, but anyway, let's make a deal is they give, they go one, two, three curtains, all right? And we'll say behind two of the curtains are like two donkeys, and behind one of them is a brand new car, all right? So, you want to pick the one with the, don with the car. So let's say, which, which one should we pick? Three. three. All right, so we all agree on three. So we're going to bet on three. All right, that's what we're going with. And so we're betting that there's donkey, donkey, right? Well, what's the chances of each one of these things happening? 33.3%, all right? So there's a, we have a pretty good chance of a car, all right? Now, I like you, so I'm going to be nice to you. We're going to remove two. So we're taking two out of the mix. So now the only thing left is one and three, which we chose. Do you want to stay or you want to change? Change. You want to change. Everyone want to change? Everyone want to stay? Any stays on three? All right. Any, any change? Okay. Why do we stay? How about the stays first? Oh, you think I'm sneaky? <laughs> you're like, I'm not giving you a car. <laughs> all right, ah, so you're a little suspicious of me and my game show friends. All right. How about, how about else? Anyone else have a reason to stay? Like, it never fails, whether it's a multiple choice test or whatever. I always erase and pick, oh, uh, wait, never mind, it's this one. And my first one is not all, obviously, it's not almost, but it's more right than my second guess. So my first guess. It, that was really long. My first guess is usually right. It is. That's your instinct. <laughs> yeah. That's your gut. That's your instinct. Yeah. So, okay. Unfortunately, in this case, your instinct is going to screw you up. And see, this is why I keep doing that. And now, I've, so now I don't want to ruin it forever. You should rely on your instinct. But changing is the right thing to do. Anyone want to tell me why changing is the right thing to do? Actually, higher than that. 66. Right. Because, is every, I'll just show you here real quick. It's confusing. And again, it kind of goes against what you might think would make sense. So 33, 33, 33, right? But then we remove, so then we're taking this one off, and I'm getting rid of this. So now, this is still 33. If this is still 33, this is 67, or whatever, 66.4. Um, right? So it always, and again, it isn't what your body or your mind would tell you to do. Because you're, you you're going with my, uh, look, you know, you're suspicious, you're, you're like, my instinct's always wrong, the second one's always better, or I always screw up, or Murphy's Law. But the truth is, none of that has anything to do with it. It is statistically always better to change. And that doesn't feel very natural, does it? So again, this is trying to balance, is like, Good to listen to your instincts on the first shot, but then sometimes, now the truth is we can't always uh, rely, you know, we're not always going to have like some calculator there, but the point is to understand that your instincts are not always going to send you in the right direction. They may actually send you in a bad direction. Um, but they could also, so again, you have to start to sort of understand them in a more refined way. Um, Boom, boom. Oops, I didn't even know I did that. Okay. Have you ever done this birthday thing? What is the chance of two people in this room having the same birthday? What do you think the chance of that is? So about, I don't know, like 48 of you, something like that? I think there's a lot of chance. You think there's a lot of chance? Anyone else agree with Yang? There's a good chance that two of you have two. Anyone disagree? Why do you disagree? Right. So, okay, should we try it? We did this once before. All right, so let's just do 
Who, who, how many Januarys? Give me a January. Okay, name out your day. 28? 9th? Anyone else? Any other Januarys? 25. 25. All right, January didn't work. February's. Number? 6. 6? Twenty-six. This is uh, George Washington's birthday. We got okay. All right, March. <coughs> Not, name, name your day. Twenty-six. First. Twelve. Fourteen. Six. Do we have two six now? No. Okay. Let's keep going. April. <laughs> Say it loudly. What's your number? No, we're not doing so well here, are we? Uh-oh, <laughs> Yang, what's going on? <laughs> okay, we just did April, uh, May. What's happening, Yang? We're falling apart here. <laughs> June. Okay. No, you're gonna just say, you're gonna wait. You're just gonna say whatever. Yeah, it's June third. June third. Two June thirds. Any other June thirds? <laughs> All right, there you go. And you're going to be June 3rd, too, just for the sake of it. Right? <laughs> so weirdly, the odds are very good. Um, and it gets confusing why, but you start saying, because every, it's a sequential novel. But I mean, I'm not even going to try to explain the math to it. Maybe Yang could do it for But it is, the odds are very good. So the probability, so if they're, like you were saying, if there are 367 people in the room because of leap year, uh, there's a 100% chance, right? There's a 99% probability if with just 57 people. So we're almost close to 99% chance of it being people with a shared birthday in here. And you, it's a 50-50 chance with just 23 people. Why? Because as you go through the math, you, you keep subtracting a week and a, a day. So it's like 365 minus 364 times the sequence of the numbers. So again, at just 23 people, which is totally counterintuitive. So if you're in a room with 23 people, there is a 50-50 chance that someone in that room is going to share a birthday. And again, that is counterintuitive, right? So again, some, the point I'm just trying to hammer on is sometimes you can use these numbers, but sometimes the statistics bear out a different thing, just like in Moneyball. All right, so when you're doing probability experiments, you want to manipulate or make an observation of the environment with an uncertain outcome and you try to predict, right? So you're going to say, here are all the variables, all right, and I'm going to try to predict using these variables of what the outcome is going to be. But there's no way I can have 100% certainty of what that outcome is going to be. But the more certainty I can have, the more likely I might want to make a bet, right? So you could do it releasing a movie. We talked about this with you know, Netflix. Netflix is using their statistical models, and this is what they say. They'll say, we know that Kevin Spacey is popular on our Netflix algorithm. We know that the House of Cards, uh, British version, was popular. We'll put the, we know that David Fincher's popular. We'll put them together, and maybe we'll have a better chance. Um, releasing a book, a play, a song, et cetera, playing a video game, delivering a sales pitch, taking a test. You can always improve the probability. And we talked about film business. You know the people at Comcast slash Universal have a lot of data that says these art house films are not really delivering the kind of returns we want. So how are we going to control that and change that? Well, we'll change the kind of movies they're focusing on. Insidious 2 is making money, and therefore let's get the person who did that, and we'll reformulate how we're going to approach this. Now, was Insidious 2 an outlier? Maybe it was a mistake, and maybe Peter Schlesel got lucky with that, and maybe Ang Lee, I mean, um, James Seamus was just in a bad streak. And so maybe they, maybe they traded their star player at the wrong time, or maybe they didn't get a star player. So, but they're using recent data to say, let's change our organization to reflect our strategy, to make money for our shareholders, and we're going to change the way we do it. We're going we're to use the data that we've collected to sort of predict a future outcome and, and set us up. And again, that's true with any, like when you're producing a movie, you want to control, you know, producing a movie is a very hard thing and there's a lot of, there's thousands of variables that you can't control. So you try to control the ones you can. The screenplay, the director, the actors, you know, so you're like, all right, worst case is we have a good screenplay, a good director, a good DP, 
good actors. So even if everything else kind of falls apart, like that should give us some kind of insurance. So when a sample space, the set of all possible outcomes of experiments is the sample space for the experiment. So what, what are all the very, like if everything, what are all the possible outcomes? And it's again, to think about for yourselves too. I was talking to someone earlier about looking for work. And it's like, well define the universe of possible places you might want to work, right? Because if you start doing that, then you can start to hone in on, right, well these are the places I might want to work. And then you look at like, well what's the chance of me working there? Or, and then again, once you start defining the space, you might be like, well, it's a, it's a much bigger space than I thought. I was narrow casting it to like two companies. And it may be much broader than that, right? Um, the outcomes in the sample space are the sample points. The sample points and the sample space depend on what experiment chooses you choose, the, what are you choosing to observe, right? So I think, now, just to, anyone know what a regression analysis is? Kind kind of yeah it's it's well he's trying to say what's what's driving that all right so it's it's um it's showing a relationship it's not showing causality but it's showing a relationship it sounds kind of like a Shirley MacLaine thing like a regression analysis but but it's, and again the great thing is with all these tools you don't have to know any of this but if you are aware of its existence it might help you so you can do regression analysis on your um, Excel it's very easy it's just you need two sets of data two numbers. And you can start to say, like, is there a relationship between these two sets of data? And if so, and then if you have lots of sets of data, you can say, all right, these two, this one is driving this, all right? So this is a kind of a dense slide, but it includes a technique for modeling and analyzing several variables when the focus is on the relationship between a dependent variable, this, don't worry about this being sounding confusing, and one or more independent variables. So we want to know what drives box office, all right? Well, is it, there's all these other variables. The budget of the movie, the release date of the movie, um, the salary of the actor, the number of films the director has made in the past. So we can put all those things and say, you know what, the number of films the director has made in the past actually seems to have a pretty big impact on box office, or it doesn't, you know? So you can start to say, huh, I didn't think that would have been there, and it, and it, and it may, you know, you would have thought maybe just a, bi a big budget is all you need to make a successful box office movie. And that has an impact too, but maybe it's just the number of films the director has made or the number of films the actor has made or the number of awards the actor has won. Um, so it helps us understand the typical value of the dependent variable. You know, I'm going to skip this because all the talk of dependent variables is probably going to scare you. So I'll put this up. <laughs> to, so to see if your data fits the models of regression, it is wise to conduct a scatter plot analysis. And that sounds confusing, but it's not. So they have a, so a regression analysis has a linear relationship. So if you put all these points, these numbers, do they have a relationship? No. Do these? Yeah, they have an inverse negative relationship. These two, too, they have a curvilinear relationship. And these, this sort of indicates a possible relationship. So it starts to say, you know what, I think there's some connection between these two. There's not necessarily causality, but there is a relationship. So, um, so this is percent of population with bachelor's degrees by personal income. So there is a relationship, you can see it, between degree and um, income, right? kind of makes sense, but you know, it's kind of interesting to see it because if there was none, then you might also sort of think things differently. Um, so the key is, is there a relationship? So you may be at work and they say, well, I'm going to do a regression analysis on that because again, you can start to have a lot of data. So in the, in the example of baseball, baseball is great because there's so much data and it's kind of over time. So there's like, what did I forget how many, it's 160 games a year. So a lot of data and under similar circumstances so you can start to get a sense. Um, but there's no relationship. So they're trying to figure out the cause of polio when, it, when in the, I would say it was probably in the 40s and 50s here in the United States. Uh, and they would do it, so they did an evaluation. And what happens is polio was, happening mostly in kids and in the summer. And what do kids do in the summer? They have ice cream. And so they started to think like, well, there's, 
but really it just says these things are happening at the same time. There's no causality, but they're happening at the same time. So for a while there, they thought polio was caused by eating ice cream, which it is not. Um, so the association is a necessary prerequisite for inferring causation, but it's also, again, getting back into, that's going to confuse you, so we're going to leave that away. Okay. So again, just look at the, um, Really just think of it as a relationship, right? And again, not causal, but that they coexist together. So when that's happening, then you might infer causality, but you can start to make some sense of things. In the film world, they always do. A lot of deals are based on regression analyses. So they say um, HBO might pay a um, television fee on a film based on a regression model on the box office performance. So the higher the box office performance, They'll regress that and they'll say, all right, this is the line we're going to do. This is sort of traditionally the line for what a film, and so we'll pay more for the higher the box office. So our fee will go up accordingly. So the higher the box office, the higher the fee. And, and that happens on a lot of things. So, and you can do those on all sorts. How many DVDs should you ship? All right? Well, I don't really know. So you might say, this movie did really well. We don't want to make too many DVDs because if no one buys them, they come back to us. So, but we can make a regression analysis and say, you know, based on this, and since it's like a kind of a maybe a feel-good movie, like it's a really warm and cuddly feel-good movie, we might actually want to go above the regression. Or if it's a really super depressing movie, but it did well at the box office, and it's not really the kind of movie people might want to buy in a store, we might want to go under. So we're going to look at the numbers, and then we're going to use our instinct to say, you know what, I think this is going to come below the regression because I don't think the people at Walmart want to buy a movie about, you know, uh, whatever, genocide or something like that. Whereas it's about a talking dog who saves the day, you know, they kind of might want that, so I might go above the regression. And these are, so that's where, you're, again, you're sort of combining hard line statistics with your own instincts about, you know, or your own sort of basic common sense about what, how things may or may not work. And just like we talked about sort of strategy and culture, same thing with, you know, instinct and empiricism, they kind of have to go hand in glove a little bit. They have to work together because you can't really have one without the other. You know, you don't need to know all this. All right, we'll just do this. So here, here's an example of, um, Film revenue and production costs, all right? Kind of makes sense, right? So there's clearly a relationship between the budget and the revenue. And let's see. What would this be? What do we call like this? An outlier. Why? Why, Malcolm Gladwell? Because it's far. It's, uh, it's, it's, it lies outside the realm of what we thought. And just like below, too. So this could be like your avatar. This could be Hyde Park. What's that? Uh, Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger. Yeah, exactly. It could be Lone Ranger. Exactly. It's, it's not. But so, again, believe me, the people at Disney did this with Lone Ranger. And it just, they thought they'd be somewhere along this line. But it was an outlier in a bad way. And it came below it. And that hurts, you know. Because, again, they did all sorts of models. And they were predicting what they thought the outcome would be. Let me skip this. Okay. So most things, again, you know, sort of in, in the world of like, you know, probably in your college and stuff like that, there's the normal curve. The normal curve is the shape of the normal curve is often illustrated as the bell curve. I'll show you. Um, all right. This is the normal. This is how most things bear out in statistics. So if you take all the data and you graph it, most things come out like this, right? This is where most things land. And then you have your outliers, all right? And we what do we call these? What's the div? We call them by standard deviations, right? So your standard, your, your deviation away from the center. But most things will come out like this. And that's your normal distribution curve. And you can kind of see it in things. So here's like um, movie business distribution of target. So this is like the percentage of movies and then how they do over. So most things kind of do kind of shape some kind of bell curve. Um, so, if you wanted to start using statistics on the film business, why so many losers? About 60% of movies lose their, lose their money. Um, 
So it sort of suggests that studios can't predict the outcome of a movie. Um, and then they start saying, all right, well, maybe we can change that. Uh, and then you say, well, can we forecast revenues for each movie and only invest in those movies where forecast revenues are, are large enough? But this is what they do. I mean, they do this. So it's, it is, it's a game. And it's just like you're going to Vegas and you're betting and you think you can control things, but it's hard. But if you can stay in it long enough, over the long run, you'll get in that normal curve. But the problem is you may make your bet in one movie and you may end up here. Or you make, you make, the worst thing is you may make your bet in the movie and you may end up like here and then you think, let's do it again. And then you end up here. So it's, yep. The other graph is a power distribution. So right. That's the actual one. So if you lose, you lose spectacularly. What's that? Yeah. If you lose, you really lose. Like that. Right. If you lose, oh, if you lose, you lose spectacularly. Yeah. And it's the same thing. It's like, it's the same thing in, um, the venture capital world. I mean, they are, so there's, you know, in the venture capital world, which is you think about like all these, um, they're betting on the outcomes, the predicted outcomes. And what are they going to, what variables are they going to look at in a predicted outcome of a startup? So people can go with their little business plans and they're going to they're gonna try to get, say, half a million dollars from a venture capital. What are the variables the venture capital firm is going to look at? Management, people run the company. Management, who's going to run the company? What else? Technology. The technology. Revenue streams or potential revenue streams? The idea. What other things are doing well in that space? Are they doing mobile? Are they not doing mobile? You know, are there competitors? So just like you do in the movie business, is like, well, is there other movies like this? Or just like in the TV business, what, what is it about this TV show that I think this pilot will get people to want to watch? And it's so hard because there's a lot of things to get you to watch. Um, you know, the story of Matthew Weiner, you know, he had been a writer on The Sopranos. HBO didn't even take his call. I mean, you know, he had worked at HBO. They didn't take his call for Mad Men. Because I think they were probably like, eh, you know, you weren't really the main guy. Like a period thing about advertising, you know, it doesn't really seem that good, you know. So what he, what he did was he executed extremely well. And it worked. And it was either in the casting or the set design or the script writing or whatever. But it worked. But it you know, easily couldn't have worked. And there's you know, tons of shows with you know, increasingly, and that's why you see a lot of famous actors going to TV, because why? Because you can get that trial. You can maybe get through that sort of uncertain period by having someone famous in there. And it, but it's very, very competitive. And they all have the same data and the same graphs, and they're looking at things. And they're, they're relying on, again, on their on the data and also on their instincts. And that's, I think I've said this story before, but it's like there's an old joke in Hollywood about you can say no, you know, 100% of the time would be right 99% of the time. <laughs> you know, it's like by saying no, you're, that's a e way easier answer to give than yes. Because by saying yes, most of the time you're going to be wrong. By saying no, most of the time you're going to be right. And that's, so that's the challenge, you know. Um, Although, you know, again, I, I, I worked at Universal and they had on the wall somewhere the, the letter that someone wrote on the passing of Star Wars. You know, kind of campy and future. I don't think anyone, there's no interest in like the space stuff. No, we'll, we'll never work, you know. Um, and I think there's, you know, a lot, I think Jerry Seinfeld has a, a letter, the past letter on Seinfeld, you know. It's like, um, and it goes back to sort of if you're the first person doing something or you're doing something that people haven't seen before, it's very hard to get your head around it. Like Google, why did Microsoft pass on Google? They thought they could do it. Um, you know, why did everybody not hire Bill James? Because he worked in a pork and beans factory. It didn't seem like he knew what he was talking about. So again, you may be that person with that innovative idea and you need to sort of figure that way to get it through so it does get the traction because it's very hard for pe you know, the people that are in the establishment to just say, no way, no, no interest. And uh, again, they're never going to cede without a little bit of a fight or struggle from you. Um, okay, so the, I'm going to post a reading assignment for next week. Um, your first case study, I'm going to give it to you next week, not this week. I think, because I think you just handed this stuff in. I'm going to go through the, um, we have your vision and mission statements. Um, if you have any questions on these, feel free to, you know, email me or come by. Um, you mostly did a good job. I think you could take them further. And again, ideally, it's a tool for yourself. Um, and uh, that's it. Thanks. So these are here right here. 
Okay.